Welcome back to Things Made Simple. My name is Tyler, and today we're going to be talking about this, Yamaha's YM3812 OPL2 sound chip. Now, I can still remember as a kid saving my pennies and going to Fry's Electronics to buy my first sound blaster. I came home and installed it and was completely blown away by the sound that it made. I want to understand what makes that sound chip tick, and what better way to do that than to build a Eurorack module. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to build a Eurorack module. It's going to be driven by MIDI. You're going to have the ability to adjust every single sound parameter. You're going to have the ability to create separate instruments for every MIDI channel. And there's even a drum channel that lets you assign patches at a note level. So I'm going to walk you through the major algorithms behind controlling the chip, how it's structured. I'll release all of the material on GitHub and you'll be able to build one of your own if you want. Let's get started. <music> Now, there are a lot of great YouTube videos out there on the theory of FM synthesis, and I don't want to try to replicate those, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, it might make sense to do a quick diversion. Inside of the YM3812 are nine different channels, each capable of generating its own sound. They could all sound the same and play different notes, or they could all sound different and play the same note, or really anywhere in between. Now, each channel is made up of two different operators that are combined to produce a single sound. It's a fundamental building block of FM synthesis, and it contains an oscillator that produces the sound with a particular waveform and at a particular pitch, and an envelope that adjusts the level of that sound over time. Seems simple, right? Well, the tricky part is how we put the two oscillators together, and that's called synthesis. Let's say we had two waveforms. Now, I've exaggerated their differences here to make it a little easier to follow, but if we were to combine these waveforms by adding them together, then we would get something that looks like this. Now, this is just basic mixing, and indeed, if you were to listen to the combination, you would hear both notes playing at the same time. Now let's try combining these waves together through frequency modulation. Because our two waves now have different roles, we have to call them different things. In this case, the modulator wave changes the frequency of the carrier wave. As the modulator wave goes up and down, the frequency increases and decreases. When the modulating wave is at a low frequency, you get something that sounds like vibrato. But when the modulator is at an audible frequency, the resulting combination has its own unique timbre. In this example, we're using the YM3812 to create a sine wave and have it modulate another sine wave. The modulation quickly increases and then slowly diminishes because of the envelope that's controlling the amount of modulation. Once the modulation diminishes to zero, then the output is just the carrier's sine wave. The oscilloscope has a frequency spectrum analysis below, and you can see how there's a whole bunch of peaks that appear when the amount of modulation increases. And then as it decreases, those peaks start to diminish until you're left with only the fundamental which is the carrier wave. Okay, one more mind-bending concept before we put all the pieces together. Now that we know how frequency modulation works, what would happen if you had a wave modulate itself? Let's start with a sine wave and slowly increase the amount of feedback. Right about here, the sine wave starts to turn into a sawtooth wave, but let's keep going. Okay, that got crazy. Basically, it just turns into an inharmonic mess known as white noise. And this actually turns out to be pretty useful because we need it to make drum sounds and other percussive inharmonic instruments. These operations are usually indicated with a plus for mixing or a multiplication for frequency modulation. Feedback on an operator is shown with an arrow looping back on itself. And while since the YM3812 only has two operators per channel, it turns out there's only those two ways of combining the operators together. The YM2151, though, for example, has four operators per channel, and they can be combined together in eight different algorithms, allowing for lots of variation and complexity in the sound. Those are the basics of FM synthesis. Now let's see how this gets represented in the registers of the chip. We can break these settings into three different types. The first category defines at an operator level how the oscillator and the envelope will function. 
Oscillator settings include things like waveform or detuning, vibrato, that kind of stuff, where the envelope settings affect things like attack, decay, sustain, and release. The second category affects things at a channel level to determine how the operators will work together to form a sound, as well as things that affect the sound overall, like the pitch of the note or whether the sound is turned on or off. The final category changes things at a global level on the chip. These properties affect all of the voices at the same time and include things like deep tremolo or deep vibrato or whether or not we're enabling native drums which we're not because try as I might, I have not figured out how to make that sound good. Now you may notice that I've grayed out some of the settings here. These settings apply to other Yamaha sound processors. And if you peek under the covers of their register settings and adopt slightly more consistent naming conventions, you can see just how similar these chips really are. Perhaps there's some opportunity in the future to create a generic sound patch that could be used across all of the YM sound chips. But we'll leave that for a future video. Now all of these settings are stored in memory locations inside of the chip called registers. The memory locations go from address 0 through 255, or FF in hexadecimal. And each register holds an 8-bit value, also between 0 and 255. Now this chip can store 279 different pieces of information. But, of course, there are 255 slots, so instead of letting every setting consume a full 8 bits of space, they decided to squeeze multiple settings into every byte. For example, let's say we took a peek at memory location 41 and found the value 4C. This value actually represents two different settings, and to find them, we have to break up the number into its eight individual binary bits. Here, the two bits in green correspond to operator number 2's level scaling setting, and the other six bits control its total level setting. Of course, the number of bits associated with a setting is going to affect the maximum value that you can use. So level scaling has to be set to something between 0 and 3, but because it has more bits, total level could be set to anything between 0 and 63. Now that's one register, but there are literally hundreds. I think we're going to need a map. The global settings are located in the first 9 bytes of memory, plus this one setting at address BD. They mostly control general chip settings along with flags for deep tremolo, deep vibrato, drums, etc. The columns on the left of this chart show exactly how each of the bits of the register on the right get broken up into its individual settings. For example, bit 5 of location BD is a 1-bit flag that turns on or off the rhythm mode. Because there are 9 channels, there are nine instances of each type of channel register. In other words, each channel gets its own memory location for the settings that are shown on the left side of the chart. So if I wanted to modify the feedback property of channel 2, I would be editing bits 1 through 3 of memory location C1. Similarly, there are nine pairs of operators, with each pair aligned to a different channel. Now these memory addresses are a little funky in that their locations are always three bytes apart. So for example, channel 1 of this first row of settings is stored at address 20 and 23, while channel 2 uses address 21 and 24, and then 3 uses 22 and 25, and then inexplicably we skip 26 and 27, and then channel 4 uses 28 and 2b. There's actually another skip later between channel 6 and 7 where we skip memory locations 2e and 2f and go straight to 30. If someone knows the reason for this, I would love to know the answer. Otherwise, thank you, Yamaha. The last bit of our map provides some orientation and shows how the channels connect to different operators and even provides offset locations for each memory address. This is probably my fifth iteration of this map, and I hope that it is of some use to you if you decide to embark on this journey. I will, of course, add this to the GitHub repo as well. Okay, so we now know where all the registers are, but how do we physically set those registers? Well, let's take a look at how each of the pins on the chip functions. You've got power and ground and some output signals for the DA converter, but for now we're just going to focus on the data and control lines. Say we wanted to write the value 4C in register 41. We're going to do this in two parts. The first part is actually selecting the register that we want to update. We start with all the control lines high. The data at this point doesn't really matter. In order for the chip to receive the information we want to send it, we need to activate it by bringing the chip select low. 
And because we are setting a register location, we want A0 to be low as well. That line determines whether we're selecting a register or we're setting some actual data at that register. At this point, we want to put our data on the bus. We want to select register 41 hex, and that corresponds to the 8 bits shown here, with the least significant bit being data line 0. Now to write the information into the chip, we need to pulse the write line by bringing it low for 10 microseconds, and then high for another 10 microseconds. At this point, the register is selected, and we no longer care about the information in the bus. OK, so now we continue to part 2. Let's write some data into our newly selected register. To do that, we need to flip A0 high so it knows we're writing data and not selecting a register. Then we output the register value onto the bus, pulse the write line low for 10 microseconds, and then high for another 10 microseconds, and now the data is officially written. So we can tell the sound processor to stop listening to the bus by bringing the chip select high again. And that's all there is to it. You've officially written the number 4C into register 41. At this point, you've got all the tools you need to control the YM3812 or really any Yamaha FM synthesis chip. I'll link in the description to some of the artifacts that we talked about, including the register map and the timing diagram, in case you guys want to dig into it further. Over the next few videos, and I'm not really sure how many videos this is going to take, but we're going to dig into some of the other algorithms associated with the project. We'll talk about the most obvious way of structuring a data structure or class around this chip and why it's probably not the best way, uh, and maybe some other ways that we can improve it to make it a little bit better. So then we'll go through the hardware, and I'll walk you through the schematic, the PCB layout, and of course we'll build the module. If you have questions, leave them in the comments, and if you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Um, and of course, if you want to go on this journey with me, then hit that subscribe button, and you'll be notified when the next video launches. My name is Tyler, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on Things Made Simple.